I know a uh, teenage girl tonight who would not come here because her parents won't let her. And the reason is they bought into doomsday prophecy and they say it's dangerous to go outside. So their parents forbid them to go outside and she can't come here because of that. I had to, she wanted to deliver a, a, a letter to her friend and I went and picked it up and delivered it for her because she wasn't allowed to go outside yesterday just to go mail something, you know. It's crazy, you know. But people actually believe this stuff and they're gripped by this demonic fear. Fear is like faith in the devil. It empowers demons when we actually listen to lies and believe it and we begin to speak it we empower demonic powers and when people get into this state chaotic things happen in their minds and their emotions many people actually think that this thing this prophecy is real I mean if you watch the news <laughs> it's chaotic the truth you know what the truth is there is no end of the world. Let me read a psalm to you. It says here, in Psalm 78, verse 69, it says, He built His sanctuary like the heights, like the earth which He established forever. Everybody say forever. God is not going to come, nor Satan is going to destroy the earth. The earth remains forever. Heaven is going to come down, and the two realms become one, and the Bible says we shall rule with him on earth forever. And you know, when Jesus splits the sky, we will have our resurrected bodies. Imagine a perfect body that never, nothing's wrong with it, having a perfect mind, look good, feel good, never have to deal with depression, you know? Anyway, this earth remains forever. Everybody declare that. The earth remains forever. I prayed on Tuesday about what to share this week and I was able to share uh, Tuesday morning. I prayed um, late Tuesday, uh, more, uh, early Tuesday morning and I woke up early 6.30 a.m. to go teach at uh, Hastings High School and on this subject, you know. When I woke up that morning, I heard these words in righteousness he will judge and make war scripture comes from Revelation 19 talks about the second coming of the Lord now I believe that the judgments of God will escalate judgment isn't always bad okay God judges to remove all that hinders love because he wants a wholehearted bride that is made ready for his second coming how many of you guys know that we are living in those days that are escalating and it will continue to escalate until Jesus splits the sky how many guys believe that it's obvious there are many signs of earthquakes and you know Israel is pretty much surrounded there's a lot of things you can research about that there's never been a time in history like now the situation that Israel is in and the economy is being shaken and we have to actually take a look at this time and Jesus commands us to know the times and season amen not the exact date but we have to know the season if we are the generation in which Jesus comes back we ought to know that we are that generation right Jeremiah 23 20 says this the anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart in the latter days you will understand it perfectly these are those days when our understanding of God's judgment will begin to become clear clearer and clearer many people are gonna be offended when God really shakes this planet the heavens of the Lord the earth he gave to men why do bad things happen because men make bad decisions right and he has to allow this planet to reap the consequences of sin and you will see many things that are volatile on the earth and when when God lifts up his hand of protection over a nation over a city people begin to blame God why, why weren't you there for us and this and that but 
in the latter days, we will understand it perfectly, the Bible says. We will, have, we will actually get a grip of what's going on, okay? When he removes all the false comforts, we only have one place to turn, right? Our eyes will turn back to him. Even the lost, when they have no more, no other place to turn, they usually turn to where? Upward. Y'all remember 9-11? The country had nowhere to turn. There was prayer everywhere. And I, be I really believe this, that 9-11 was the beginning of a shaking and God was calling America to repentance and if she doesn't repent he will actually allow other things to take place to call us back to the place of humility of repentance and turning from our wicked ways and he will hear us from heaven the Bible says in Daniel 8 23 that in the latter days sin will reach its heights there will never be a time of darkness as it is in these last days and it continues to increase okay and in revelation 9 21 says they did not repent of their murders sorcerers sexual immorality sin is going to be so thick worldwide you will you will see the most demonized people on the planet but i got good news in that darkness isaiah 60 says he will rise in his people and shine. You will see the greatest power. You will see the greatest glory. You will see the manifestations of God like never in the history of the human race. The book of Acts and the generation of Moses, it was powerful. But in these last days, you're going to see the power of God release in such greater measure globally, everywhere. John 14, 12 says this, the works that I do, you will also do, and greater works than these will you do. I believe this is talking about the latter days when the miracles and the power of God is going to be released in the measure we've never seen before. Greater than the works that Jesus has done when he was on this earth. Matthew 13, 30 says this, let both grow together unto the harvest in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Righteousness and wickedness matures in these last days, according to the word of God. There will be those who hate Jesus, those who love sin and hate Jesus are going to hate him more in the last days than ever. It's going to escalate. Do you know there's going to be a time when they actually will worship, most of the earth will worship the Antichrist. They will think he's the Messiah, and they will think that Jesus is the imposter, and they will go to war to try to destroy him. Jesus is not going to come until his wife, his bride, his church has been made ready. He's not going to come until we are ready. We are made ready. Until we mature as a church in unity and the spirit and the bride say come the bride and unity of the holy spirit say come chapter 19 verse 11 now i saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true in righteousness he judges and makes war years ago about seven years ago i wrote a song here he comes here he comes behold the lamb here he comes here he comes, behold the Lamb of God, riding on a white horse, whose riders call faithful and true. With righteousness he will judge and make war. So I wrote this song not even understanding what it was all about. Later on, I began to research this, and it was, it was just words that came to me when I was reading the scripture. I wrote the song. Later on, I realized it was about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And his eyes are flaming with fire. That's his zeal for his bride. The fire in his eyes is burning passion, desire for his bride. And anybody that gets that mess with her, the Bible says, he will tread upon the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. Did you know that there's a time when Jesus treads upon, you know the winepress is about people stumping on grapes, right? 
the grapes, guess who the grapes are? The army of the Antichrist. This warrior king comes and he begins to annihilate this army that challenges him. This army that comes against him, thinks they can destroy Jesus. I, I don't want you to just take my word. I, I want you to find it in the scripture and pray about this and see it for yourself in the Bible. Because so, some of the things I'm going to bring up might be pretty new, okay? <laughs> his eyes were flamed with fire and on his head were many crowns. Crown speaks of authority, king, kingly authority. Multiple, multiple crowns, okay? Manifold authority. He had a name written on him except... No one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dripped with blood, dipped with blood. That's not the blood of the Lamb of God. That's the blood of the lion who comes and judges and makes war. Okay? That is not his blood. That's his enemy's blood. Did you know that Jesus is going to kill and replace the governments of the earth when he comes back? Those who took the mark will have to die. I know this is kind of graphic, but it is what the Bible says it is, okay? And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and his name was called the Word of God. Did you know that before he, his name was Jesus, he was called the Word of God? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, okay? <laughs> now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, he will judge the nations, strike the nations with the word of his mouth, releases power and judgment on the nations, that, on the people and the ones that refuse to say yes to him. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads upon the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. The same God with burning desire for his bride. The same God that is tender and patient and kind and loving. Bears with those whom he loves. Is the same God that's going to crush his enemies. Violently. I know this is something that might be new to you. But if you read the scripture and examine it. And pray about this. You know, you can't really take this in without the Holy Spirit. Okay. He's going to come as a warrior king and he's going to crush his enemies. Okay. Why? Because they're going to want to kill you and I. I've had so many end time dreams. It's, I can't even, I mean, there's so many that, come to me about the rise of the beast and all that and you know most of the time we, we, we go on with life we don't really think about that but uh, it's reality it's going to happen if, if we don't see these events in our lifetime our children will probably see it we need to leave a legacy we need to train them in the word they need to know their eternal future so as king of kings, Jesus strikes the nations to remove all the wicked leaders. Let me read to you Isaiah 63, verse 3 and 6. I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the people no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my, I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments. I have stained all my robes. Real blood? Blood people? He's, tr he's, he's trampling the enemies of the church in these last days. And there's blood all over him. And people, people don't get this. Jesus, who is this? Let's go to Ephesians 1, verse 9 and 10. Having made known... To us the mystery or the hidden plan of his will that he might gather together all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him and then Revelation 3 12 says this the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from my God he's going to bring heaven and earth 
together. This is his original plan. In the book of Genesis, he walked, God the Father walked with Adam in perfect fellowship. Jesus is going to come one day, split the sky, take over the planet, kill unrighteous leaders, replace them with godly, righteous saints. And for a thousand years, we have a job to do to prepare the earth for the Father to come. And the Bible says the tabernacle of God will be with men and we will dwell with him forever. That is his plan. God's eternal plan is to live with men on the earth forever, just like it was in the garden. There's going to be a thousand year period when Jesus, with the saints great and small, are going to begin to restore this planet. I know this is a new concept to some of y'all, but it's in the word. I'm giving you the scripture you can study for yourself. Now, why am I talking about this? Because there are people who actually believe that today was the end of the world. We got to tell them, hey, this, even Christians. I knew a Christian called me the other day and said, I've been scared. I know it's not true, but it just, it just, I hear so many people say it. It's kind of creepy. It scares me. Let me give you some more scriptures. The most important thing is that you actually write these scriptures down and find it for yourself in the Bible. Don't just take my word for it. Get it in the Bible yourself, okay? 1 Corinthians 15, 37. And what you sow, you do not sow that the body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed as his own body. Okay, so when you sow a seed, you don't get a seed, right? You get eventually a body. You get, you sow a seed, you get a plant, okay? Can I say something? Can I submit to you? Your life is a seed to your resurrection. What you do here determines what you become. How great the glory you will have in the resurrection is what you do with your life here. When you give it away, or when you hold on to it. Whatever you give away is eternal. Whatever you hold on to is temporary, okay? All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial one and the glory of the terrestrial one is another. There's the glory of the sun, another the glory of the moon, and another the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. One star is brighter than the other star. The moon, of course, is not as bright as the sun. Okay? And then we read on to there. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption and is raised in incorruption. There's going to be saints that aren't so bright. And there's going to be saints that are gloriously bright in the resurrection, and it's determined by what we do with this life. When we give a little cup of water, when we pray for our enemies, when we choose to say no to sin, when we make decisions to live for godliness. Matthew 6.10 says this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. The kingdom is already here, the Bible says, but it's limited. It's not going to be fully manifested until Jesus comes back. Matthew 19, 28 says this. Jesus said unto them, Assuredly I say to you, that in the regeneration, in the age to come, in the resurrection, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters, or fathers, or mothers, or wife, or children. Now, these are the things that are most dear and closest to, to us, right? Our brother, fathers, mothers, wives, husbands. But we put God even before them. Our lands, property, okay? For my name's sake, he says. If you did it for the name of Jesus, you shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. If I gave away one house, I get a hundred houses? I don't know. 
but it's a hundredfold. I don't know how the math works. And it's not for two seconds, it's for ever and ever and ever. Now, I want to challenge you with a thing that Jesus said. He said, do not store up for yourself treasures in this life. Is that not a command? But store for yourself treasures in heaven, right? How many actually really live that? Of course, it's so easy because we're in the physical realm. It's so common and so normal to take care of things that pertain to this life. But Jesus says, no, don't do that. This is kingdom thinking. That's not how you're supposed to live. You live to give it away, to lay it down, to follow me, take up your cross, and you're really going to have life. This is the simple gospel, which is so hard to live. (laughs) And when you really believe this and jump into this 100%, you actually enter into eternal life. It begins here, but it's not fully manifested. Now, I don't have a lot of uh, money in my savings account right now, which is okay. But I believe I got some, something in my heavenly account, <laughs> which, well, maybe not that much. Maybe. But you know what? If I don't really believe that, I'm not really going to want to give my time, my money, myself. My hopes and dreams, my career plans. And get on my face and say, God, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to be? Where do you want me to live? How do you want me to spend my time? Right? This is your future you're investing into. Do you know that there will be people who will be so regretful that they've squandered their whole life living for what is a moment? And this is actually the only regret we'll ever have. There's no more, none of that bad stuff in heaven. But when you stand before Jesus at the judgment, the the Bema seat, where he gives you rewards, some actually do not have a lot of rewards and some will have much reward. It's very clear. There's people actually have been there and said, (laughs) they've seen these things and the worst regret, the worst thing that could happen is that we lived just like the rest. We believed on Jesus, but we didn't truly believe him with action. And that's the worst thing we can do is to waste it all for nothing. Everybody say, I don't want to waste it all for nothing. I am not successful because I have a big ministry. I'm not successful because I make a lot of money. I have neither of that. I'm not successful because people like me. I'm not successful because I have privileges and all these things and I have a nice car. I don't have any of that. Andy knows. <laughs> he makes fun of my car. Okay. But I tell you, I am profoundly successful when my heart is growing in the knowledge of God. When Jesus is the one who wakes me up in the morning. Now I struggle with this. I'm not t- standing here before you saying, you know, <laughs> I got this relationship with Jesus. I'm always connected. There are times when I say, God, where are you? Where has thou gone? You know, King James Version. Why has thou forsaken me? But there's something inside of me that says, you are not going to stay there, dude. You're going to groan. You're going to cry out. You're going to do something. Have you guys ever been in a season where you just... Don't want to do anything but watch movies. You you guys ever been there? The times where you're like, where are you, God? What's all these wonderful promises, all that? Guess what? 
those are the times when we actually learn to be faithful. Do you know when you don't feel like doing something godly, like turning off your TV, that's godly. <laughs> now, I'm not saying TV is bad, but too much TV is bad, okay? Okay? It is those little times when Jesus says, yes, he loves me. It's when you actually resist every urge inside of you to, to, to be distracted with things. And you say, no, I'm turning my affections to Jesus whether I feel like it or not. I'm going to open my Bible. I'm just going to read until I hear something from God. I'm going to pray until he answers. You know, I'm just trying to be real. I'm like, not as spiritual as I want to be right now. Okay, if you guys know what I'm saying. I am in a season where I am knocking and it seems like there's nobody on the other side. But you know what? I think those are some of the best seasons in the Lord if I choose with my heart and not allow myself to give in to compromise. So Lord, let's stand to our feet. Help us tonight, Lord, as a people to set our eyes on the things which are eternal. You are coming back very soon, Lord. This earth is being shaken. The economy is being shaken. The, the land is being shaken. Lord, the hearts of men will fail in these last days. But Lord, our hearts cannot fail if it's connected to you, Lord. You know, whether I preach good or not is not even the issue, right? I mean, it's, it's just, I can't worry about that. Only thing I need to worry about is, Jesus, did I do all what you want me to do, right? We got to get to that place. God, where am I at with you? That's all that really matters. Is my heart growing? I think these are the times when he actually brings us to the core reason why we're alive. You know, sometimes you have to go through times when nothing seems to go right because that really tells you what's really in your heart. As long as I've been in the ministry, I've met too many ministry junkies, if you know what I'm saying. Our whole identity is in our ministry. Okay? I've been there, done that. I don't ever want to go back there again. Or you meet a businessman and his whole identity is in how much money he makes, right? You meet a prophetic guy and his whole identity is how well he prophesies, right? I guess the simple thing I can say tonight is, can we just go back to being lovers of God? That's our whole identity. God, I just want to grow in love with you each and every day. My heart to be more connected with you. You are the reason that I'm alive, God. I'm alive to be with you in your presence. One thing, hear your voice and know who you are, how you feel about me, how your heart beats for me. And in these last days, when things begin to shake, I will not be moved because only you move me, Lord.